Dear listener, dear listener, I hope that you are having a good day wherever you are in the world. And I hope that you visit the Politocrat Daily Podcast online store with new merchandise almost daily and a whole lot of variety as well. It's not just t-shirts, although my goodness me, have you checked out the Destination series lately? Oh, it's priceless. You have to take a look at the Politocrat Daily Online Store. I mean, this online store is just... Anyway, I'm not just saying it because I'm the one that designed everything you see. I'm saying it because it's really true. I'm telling you, that Destination series, some brand new t-shirts on the way as well. New shipments have come in. And you have to take a look at them. And there's so much more to feast your eyes on and buy. Please buy. I think you'll like them. You'll look great in them, even greater than you already look. At the Politocrat Daily Podcast online store at the-politocrat.myshopify.com. Shop right now. Thank you for your support. Welcome to the Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore. It is Sunday, April the 11th, 2021. On this edition of the Politocrat, this is us. And no, I am not talking about the television series. Vaccination is the way forward. Please, everybody, get vaccinated for COVID-19. This is a disease that has killed over 3 million people worldwide. It has killed millions of people. I mean, and in your country, wherever you live, the death rates are high. I mean, people are losing their lives at record rates. It's alarming, and we have to pay attention, and we have to care. So please, please, and I know there's a lot of lies being circulated on social media platforms, and I really want these social media companies and people like Jack Dorsey and Mark Zuckerberg to shut all of this lying and all of this garbage down that says that this vaccine is evil and it's this and it's that and it's got stuff in it that they put in it. This is doing untold damage damage to millions of people who now, reading the lie, are circulating it themselves to others. And everyone who reads this lie and believes it, oh, I'm not going to take this vaccine. I want you to understand, to whomever this applies, that the best way forward for us to get out of this deep hole of all these variants, all these new variants coming along, and increasingly infectious and rising rates in the U.S. and other places around the globe. Brazil is through the roof right now. And so many other countries, please. There are so many people who will never get to be vaccinated and not because they don't want to be. It's because of the resources being kept and hoarded by the U.K., by the U.S., by other rich countries, while the very countries that they had a huge hand in making poor are the ones who will never get vaccinated because of the resources and the control. It's really a problem. And I know there are organizations like COVAX that are doing great work and trying to change the balance of that. But the reality is, is that there is stockpiling going on. That I can tell you is the truth. And when you know all of that information, it should really be an impetus for you to take this vaccine. Please take this vaccine. Please get vaccinated. Please. This is how we start to get rid of this COVID-19 virus and push it down underground. So, dear listener, please tell everyone you know to get vaccinated and get vaccinated today. And don't forget... Make sure you wear a mask as well and keep practicing physical distancing and remember to wash your hands. It's so very important. 
Thank you very much. The root of the black man's hatred is rage. And he does not so much hate white men as simply wants them out of his way. And more than that, out of his children's way. The root of the white man's hatred is terror. A bottomless and nameless terror. Which focuses on this dread figure, an entity which lives only in his mind. Traffic stop, 1836. Put your hands out the window! Put your hands out the window! How many occupants? All units, 13. How many occupants are in the vehicle? What's going on? How many occupants are in your vehicle? It's only myself. Why are your weapons drawn? What's going on? Open the door slowly and step out! Open the door! I'm not getting out the vehicle. What's going on? Get out the car! Open the door slowly and get out! What's going on? Get out of the car! Now! Open the door and get out of the car! Hold, still, hold, 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 hold. Keep your hands outside the window! Keep your hands outside the window! My hands are right here. What's going on? Get out of the car now! Get out of the car! What now! is going on? Get out of the car now! Get out of the car now! I'm serving this country and this is how I'm treated? Yo, what? guess what? I'm a veteran too. I'm going to obey. That's Get not... out of the car! What's going on? Get out of the car now! What's going on? What's going on? You're fixing to ride the lightning, son. I'm sorry, what? Get out of the car now! What's going on? Get out on? of the car now! Get out of the car! Sir, just get out of the car! Work with us and we'll talk to you. Get out the car. You receive an order. Obey it. I'm, I'm, a, I'm honestly afraid to get out. Can I? Yeah, you, you should be. Going? Get out. What's get going out. on? What get out the I car. Do? Get out now. I have not committed any crimes. You're being stopped for a traffic violation. You're not cooperating at this point right now. You're under arrest for a traffic. For, you're being detained. Okay, you're being detained for, for a traffic justice. traffic violation. I do not have to get out the vehicle. You haven't even told really? me why I'm being stopped. Really? Get your hands. Get, get out of the car now. Get out of the car. Get your hands off me, get please. The... Get your hands off me. You know what? Get your hands off me. Get, get your hands off me. Back up, baby. I didn't do anything. Don't do that, sir. Get out of the car Don't now. Do that. Hey, sir. Don't get out of the car that. now. Sir, Don't do, look, I'm trying to talk to you. Okay. I'm trying to I'm, talk. I'm get out. Just relax. get out of the car. Can you please get relax? Out. Can get you out. please relax? Get out of the car right I, now. Man. This is not how you treat a vet. Uh, I'm actively serving this country, and this is how you're going to treat me? Back up, I didn't do anything. Whoa, hold on. Back What's up. going on? Hold on. Watch. Watch it. Air Force deployed. Get out of the car. <laughs> Get out of the car now! The, the up. The car now! Sir, just get out of the car! I'm trying to breathe. Ugh. Get out of the car now! That's up. That's really up. Yeah, oh, get out of the car and get on the ground now. You're gonna get it again. I, I don't even want to reach for my seatbelt. Can you? Take your seatbelt off and get out of the car. Can you please? Get out of the car now! <sighs> Listen! <sighs> Take off your seatbelt and get out of the car. Look, I'm just gonna just please. You're gonna do what you're told. Get out of the car. My, look. My take your seatbelt off and get out of the car. Look. Take your seatbelt off. Look, my hands are out. Take your seatbelt off and get out my of the car. My hands are out. Don't reach in there, Daniel. Don't reach in there. My hands are out. Please. Please. Look. This is really messed up. My dog is in the back. My dog is choking right get now. Get out of the car. Take your seatbelt off. What are you, a specialist, Corporal? What are you? I'm a lieutenant. Lieutenant, get out of the car. Take your seatbelt off and get out of the car. You made this way more difficult than it had to be. You just complied. Get out of the car. I'm reaching for my seatbelt. Fine. Take your seatbelt off and get out of the car. Straight on the ground. Straight onto the ground. Ma'am. Is your commanding officer you available? Down. Let's go. Is your commanding Let's officer go. available? Get on the ground. Get on the ground. Please talk to Get on the ground now. 
Get on the ground and you're getting sprayed again. Get on the ground. Can you please talk to me about what's going on? Get on the ground. Get on the ground now. Can you please talk to me about what's going on? Get on the ground. Can you please talk to me about what's going on? Yes, sir. You're not. Can you please talk to me about what's going on? Why am I being treated like this? Why? If you're not cooperating, get on the ground. Why am I being treated like this? This is really messed up. This is really Come messed on, up. Sir, <laughs> sir well, just what just this, this is really, this is up. Sir, 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 this is up. I had to play that. And this is, um, well... This is what happens in this country every single day. That was the excruciating audio from video of Lieutenant, Lieutenant Caron Nazario. And this actually happened roughly four months ago now. U.S. Army Lieutenant Caron Nazario, an Afro-Latino man, was driving in Virginia. And all of a sudden, in the city of Windsor in Virginia, he is pulled over at a gas station. I guess he was in a gas station, and he pulled him over. And as you heard there, that was about, what, four or five minutes worth of uh, video, audio, well, not video for you, but, you know, audio that you heard from the video of the cell phone and dashboard videos of both Lieutenant Nazario and of these police officers in Virginia. It's just disgusting. Police officers Joe Gutierrez And Joe Gutierrez is a Latino, looks like a white Latino, who was screaming at Lieutenant Nazario. Screaming at him. Very threatening. There was nothing that the lieutenant did. He didn't do anything. Now, I will say this, and the other cop was a white cop named Daniel Crocker, who, if you look at this video, and you will... If you dare look at it, I'm sure a lot of people have seen this video now um, because it's been on social media for a few days. But if you look at that, you'll see that he seems to, in in some way, is telling him, please get out of the car. He's kind of, I don't want to say he's sympathetic to him, but he's a younger officer who I think at some point is hoping he gets out of the car. They're both in, both of these cops are wrong. Now, should the lieutenant have got out of the car? I think he should have. However, however, how many times has a black person got out of a car and been killed? How many times? If you go on YouTube right now, there is video you will find. And that will not be in the newsletter today for this episode that shows a black man being asked to get his license and step out of the car at a gas station, by the way, which is exactly where Lieutenant Caron Nazario was when all of this happened, what you just heard. And he goes to get his driver's license And is shot up in a hail of bullets. Shot eight or nine times. In broad daylight. At a gas station in Georgia. Or in Texas. Or in Florida. One of those three states. I think it was Georgia or Texas. Whichever one of those three states. Georgia, Texas or Florida. And literally. This cop. This white cop. Blasts him with bullets. Miraculously. This brother survived. This young black, this black man survived. Was injured seriously, but but, but survived incredibly. The racists out there would say, well, he's a, this cop was a bad shot. 
But this is one of the reasons why Lieutenant Caron Nazario didn't want to get out of the car. Because he has seen that movie too. He knows what that movie's ending is. As does every black person who is conscious conscious and sentient. Caron Nazario, the lieutenant in the United States Army, had every right to be skeptical and cautious. Yes, he should have got out of the car, but again, how many times has getting out of a car resulted in police murdering a black person? I can throw you another example. In Minneapolis or in Oklahoma, whichever one, I mean, I think it was Oklahoma, there was a white female police officer named Betty, whatever her last name was, who told, I believe it was Terrence Crutcher, black man, to get out of his vehicle. There was a helicopter filming, a police helicopter or a news helicopter, I forget which, it could have been one of both or either, But the point is, there was a helicopter above filming all of this. Terrence Crutcher, I believe it was Terrence Crutcher, complied, got out of the vehicle. He was told to put his hands on top of his head. And he was told to walk. And he walked with his hands, I believe he was told to walk. He had his hands on top of his head. And this white female police officer shot him in the back of his head, killing him. This is why Lieutenant Caron Nazario did not want to get out of his car. Because when the police tell you, as a black person, to get out of your vehicle, it might well be the very last time that you ever get out of your vehicle in your life. I can dial up many more examples. George Floyd is an example. The police had to force him out of his car. Why do you think that that happened? George Floyd also was in the very same Scenario. And he expressed fear. He expressed being scared in the form of, I can't believe this is happening. I'm sorry. I I don't understand. I've been shot by police. This George Floyd had already been shot by police. I want to say that again for those of you in the back of the auditorium. George Floyd had already, in a previous situation, been shot by police. And then the question becomes, why did the police have to shoot him in that scenario? He has every reason to be afraid. Any black person in the world, much less here in the United States, but particularly here in the United States, has every reason to be very, very afraid when the police tell you to get out of your vehicle. And when the police stop you, period, whether they ask you to get out of your vehicle or not. Any black person in the United States of America, any black person in the world, has every right to be afraid, to think that it's the last moment of their lives. I've had my own personal experience with this. Here in California, 
within the last few years, in the last four years, this has happened, where I was stopped, broad daylight, on the shoulder of a highway, not far from here in San Francisco, on a Sunday, and it is Sunday, April 8th, um, excuse me, April 11th. I'm not going to go into that, except I was sitting in that vehicle for what seemed like forever. And they took so, well, I'm going into it. They took so much time looking at my ID. I mean, it was totally designed to intimidate and keep me in a state of dread and fear. Totally was. There was no reason to keep me there for 25 minutes. They wouldn't have found anything on my record because my record's clean. These guys just wanted to fuck with me. Two white cops. One of them a veteran officer. One of them, these is California Highway Patrol. One of them a rookie. Both white men. Hands on the steering wheel for 25 minutes. And I am expecting the bullets. I'm expecting them. Is that how you think a person should live? We get pulled over. And we are bracing for the end of our lives? Really? You think that that's acceptable, do you? I want to know who thinks that is acceptable, that a human being should be pulled over and then sit there in dread for what seems like two hours, never mind 25 minutes, and think that this is the end of your life coming. In America, that is exactly the expectation for any black person. Philando Castile was in his car when that officer Yanez executed him. And not only was he in the car, his girlfriend was in the car or his wife, I forget which, I think it was his girlfriend. And their four-year-old daughter was in the car. Four years old. So whether we are asked to get out of a car or whether we are asked to stay in a car by the police, when it comes to us, we are fearing for our lives. We know that this is potentially the end of our lives here. Philander Castile was murdered by Officer Yanes and it was caught on Facebook live because his girlfriend sitting in the back of the vehicle was streaming this live on Facebook. Right in front of her, she's in the back seat with their daughter. At some point, with all the barrage of video that you've seen and the audio that you've heard, you've got to think, this is a barbaric society that you're living in. You've got to be thinking that, don't you? Or do you say pass the Grey Poupon and just go about your business and then turn away from everything and pretend it's, oh, it's not happening to me, thank God. Whew. There, but for the grace of God, go I. And you just walk away, walk away and go ahead like nothing's happened. Is that how you deal with this? It's terrifying. It's terrifying. This police have got so much power. So much power. A badge, a gun. The system backs them up. They don't go to prison. They don't get indicted. They don't get anything. They keep their pension. They keep their salaries. And if they do get fired from a force, within a couple of months, they are on another force 
10 miles down the road or the next town over. It's very hard to convict a police officer. They rarely go to prison, especially when it's for killing black people. They don't get any jail time. And if they're convicted, they get very little jail time and they get their sentence halved. They get no jail time. Amber Geiger, who shot and killed both of Jean a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, was convicted. And then her sentence dropped. She got some kind of bogus sentencing where it was 10 years or five years. I think it was 10 years. And you know she's not going to get to serve all 10 years. She'll be out in a couple of years. She'll be out in 18 months. She'll be out in 12 months. And especially when it's a white cop doing this. And yes, there have been black cops who have done this. And yes, there have been Latino cops like Officer Yanez, who shot and killed Philando Castillo. Castile, excuse me. And he shot, and then that was in Minneapolis, in Minnesota. Or certainly in, in the state of Minnesota, to the best of my recollection. Same state as George Floyd. And Yanez was acquitted in trial, acquitted of these murder charges. Even with video. These cops never get, rarely if ever, rarely get convicted. There was one in Kentucky a a few years back, maybe about three years ago now, where that white cop got convicted of killing a, a young black boy. A black boy. That was like the first time in forever. These cops have got so much power. So much power. That's why Lieutenant Caron Nazario didn't get out of his car, didn't want to. He said it, you just heard him a few minutes back on that audio saying, I'm afraid to, to be honest with you, I'm afraid. And then that cop, Joe Gutierrez, trigger-happy Latino cop, said, you should be. You should be. You should be. This is some really, really evil stuff. This racist cop And these racist police and a racist system whereby if you're white, you might be afraid, but you know you're not going to be killed by these cops. Yes, there's been one exception to that. And that was something that was completely aside and away from anything else that ever happens. And that cop, a Sudanese American black cop in Minnesota, he got convicted. As he should have been, by the way. And I'm glad that he did get convicted of shooting Justine DeMond, the white woman from Australia who was standing by, I think she was literally standing out in the street by the vehicle. And this is the cop is in his vehicle and he shoots through the door and he kills her. I mean, something like that. It's just it's just absolutely asinine. She should still be here. But at least in that case, her husband and her family got justice for her. What's going to happen with George Floyd's family? Do you think they're going to get justice? Lieutenant Caron Nazaria has filed a lawsuit against the Windsor, Virginia police for their brutality and heavy-handedness. You're spraying this guy with mace? He's not a danger. He has, he is, his arms are out. His arms are showing, his hands are showing. Why are you spraying him? He's the only occupant in the vehicle. He's a lieutenant in the U.S. Army. He's on active duty. It doesn't matter even if he was a bum down the street. It doesn't matter. We always, and I get guilty of this too. We always talk about, oh, well, he's decorated. It doesn't matter if he's got four stars or no stars. It doesn't matter if he's in the army or he's not. It doesn't matter. We always talk about status. It's about how you treat people.
And the reason I talked about this jury in the George Floyd murder and the trial of Derek Chauvin for that murder is I'm telling you there are white people in this country who don't see anything wrong with what Derek Chauvin did to George Floyd. And there are white people in this country who don't see anything wrong with what the police did to U.S. Army Lieutenant Karan Nazario back in December, December the 5th, 2020, was when this happened, what you just heard a few minutes ago. It's at night, doesn't matter when in the day it is, but it is at night, the guy has every reason as a black man, black and Latino man, to be afraid for his life. And he's in his army uniform. Doesn't matter to these cops. They don't care what uniform you're wearing, what uniform you've got on. You could have been Danny Glover. You could have been Viola Davis. You could have been Denzel Washington. They would have still done the same damn thing, you know. That cop would have. That cop you heard, he would have done the same damn thing. Get out of the car. Oh, I'm Viola Davis. I don't care who you are. Get out the car. You know I'm telling you the truth. He would have done the same thing. And you know it. He would have done exactly the same. You heard the way he talked to Lieutenant Nazario when he said, I'm afraid. I'm afraid to get out of the car. And he says, you should be. What kind of kind of policing is that? I'll give you the answer. It's escalation. That is not a de-escalating situation. The guy has told you that he is afraid. He fears for his life. And the whole motto of police, I know it's definitely the supposed motto in Los Angeles, is to protect and serve, right? That's what, <laughs> that's what the LA police model uh, motto was. <laughs> or is. I don't know if they still have that. As a, as a, under Daryl Gates, to, to protect and serve? Well, you're supposed to, as a police officer, uphold the peace. And I guess if you as a cop think that upholding the peace is best effectuated by killing black people, then that's what you're going to do. And if you've got a system that backs that up and perpetuates that, then of course you've got no problem. Coupled with all these police shows, all the films that glamorize Dirty Harry, who is San Francisco's own, you know, Dirty Harry Callahan, played by Clint Eastwood. That was all here in San Francisco, California, dear listener. You do know that those Dirty Harry films were filmed and focused or at least set here in San Francisco. And you also know that Clint Guntoten Eastwood was the mayor of Carmel, California, less than three hours drive south of San Francisco. And you know the kind of politics that Clint Eastwood has. Oh, yeah, that one. That's the guy that talked to a blooming chair in 2012 at the Republican National Convention on the closing night of that convention. I believe it was. Sat, stood up there. Guy was in his 70s at the time or 80s or whatever because he's in his 80s now. Or something like that. He's, this, is a, this is a grown ass man talking to a chair, an empty chair, and saying, oh, Obama, oh, what? Oh, really? Dude, you're embarrassing. And that's the mentality of the country for a lot of people. Just a culture is dead at times. It's dead. Dead. And this is the thing. And you've got all these TV shows. I can go back to the 50s. I can go back to the 60s and 70s with Barnaby Jones and Beretta and, you know, all these shows in the 60s and 70s. 
Dragnet with, you know, Joe Friday. Dur, 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 dur. Uh, all of this inculcation in American society about police being the world's best people and all a barrage of Kojak and Columba. A bar- and I like some of these. I'm not sitting here demonizing the shows necessarily because I actually liked Columbo. I liked Kojak. I liked Ironsides. I liked all that some of it loaded. So did you. If you, come on, if you've ever heard of any of those, I think they show reruns of them on various cable outlets. You could probably stream them and find them on YouTube or something. The Streets of San Francisco, come on. You didn't like The Streets of San Francisco with Carl Malden and with Michael Douglas? Love that show. That was my favorite show back then in the 70s. The Streets of San Francisco. And it was all about glorifying these police. Always. So the so American society is completely in love with the police. The entertainment industry, Hollywood, shows this. And it's done to give a sense of manufactured consent, give a sense of, oh, the police are, they care about you. And at the same time, it demonizes the bad guys. And who are the bad guys in a lot of these TV series? Come on now. Come on now. Some junkie, some black person, some brown person, some white junkie or some white poor person is the bad guy. Or this guy that appears to be rich, but he's really, well. But it's so sanitized. Because even on things like law and order, which is the which people love Law and Order. Do you watch Law and Order? I stopped watching it many a year ago, and it's still on the air. And not only is it on the air, there's about eighteen different iterations of it. <laughs> Special Victims Unit, Homicide Unit, and now Christopher Maloney is back. He's come back and he's got an anger management problem and he's just gone through all this tragedy and he's back and he's made a return to Law and Order. Homicide unit. <laughs> it's just, this is where the culture has been forever in the United States when it comes to police. So by the time you hear in real life about Lieutenant Caron Nazario being pepper sprayed, half the country doesn't care. But it's not just because they've been indoctrinated and inculcated and the manufactured consent, the manufactured consent given to them through these police shows. It's also because people are racist and bigoted and don't view black people as human beings or as equals, period. They don't. So their view of this is, oh, and I'm not saying everyone. I'm saying there's a significant swath of the country that doesn't care. Oh, just another video of a black man being shot, killed, pulled over, pepper sprayed, uh, past the Great Poupon, then let's go. And that that's the culture. That's a dead culture. If that's what you do, that's a dead culture. But if a cat gets killed, if a dog gets killed, <laughs> that's the culture we live in, you see. More concern about the cat or the dog than about the actual human being. Especially if that human being's black. Yeah, that's the one issue that those cops in that lawsuit that they're going to defend will say is that, well, he didn't get out of the vehicle. And that's their strongest, their strongest argument. But again, When you look at 400 years of history, there is an even stronger argument for why U.S. Army Lieutenant Karan Nazario did not get out of his car immediately. If we 
in this country, the US of A, really believed in the humanity of all. If we really truly believed in the humanity of black people, we would have laws and we would have laws reflecting that. We would have these provisions in laws that accounted for when it comes to these kinds of cases that accounted for the reasonable black person standard, not the reasonable police officer standard. We would also alone, not just that alone, we would also have the reasonable black person standard. What was that black person's thinking? What could a black person expect to feel and think at that moment when a cop pulls them over? Why didn't that why doesn't that get inculcated into the criminal law in the United States? If we really cared, if we say because we say we care, right? We say we do. It's like what James Baldwin has always said, once said. They say they care. What they care about, but they don't really care, is what he said. They say they care, but they don't really care. People who talk about the world and say they care about it don't really care about it. What they care about is their safety and their profits. And that's the truth. That is in a distillation of what the American culture is. Safety and making money and making profit. Nothing wrong with either of those things. It's not uh, nothing wrong with those two concepts I'm talking about. There's everything wrong with the cultural framework, but those two things are not bad things. I like the idea of safety. I like the idea of being safe or safer. I like the idea of people in general being safe and, or safer and about safety. That I like. The idea of making money is great, is good. I think it's terrific. And making profits, yeah, that's good too. As long as, of course, you don't exploit workers to do it. And of course, in this world, that ain't happening. Just check with Amazon workers and they'll tell you for a start. But people who do say they care, I agree with James Baldwin. And you know I quote him often often here on this podcast. People really don't care. I mean, people, obviously, there are people who care. There's a lot of people who care. Of course there are. But people who often make the loudest noise about that really have some other agenda. If we did care about black people in this country, or in any country, but I'm going to talk specifically about this one, the U.S. of A., then wouldn't there be something in law, in criminal law, or in any kind of law that's codified that said that there should be, when we deal with these cases, a reasonable black person standard as weighed against the police or just not have the reasonable cop standard at all because these cops just walk all the time? Why do you think I'm so pessimistic about Derek Chauvin? So pessimistic about the idea that there's really you think he's going to walk you think he's not going to walk rather i hope i'm wrong i know i've said this every every day that you know i'm trying not to keep going because it is a very pessimistic view but it's one that's reasonable because we've had 400 years of of this kind of thing or at least 200 years of it since police have not been around for quite for 200 years but in this country but we, we've had this so often. And for those of you who have much more optimism about this particular situation than I do, good for you. I, I wish I could be there with you. I really do. I, honestly, but as a black man in this country, phew, good grief, man. I hope you look at history, those of you. And maybe you can do both. You can look at history and still think that this guy's going to get convicted. I get that. But do not jump for joy right now because this case, this trial is far from over. This is where we are. And this is us, by the way. I do not want to hear any other politician, including those in the White House, talking about this is not who we are. 
And as I keep saying here, only people who have not looked squarely in the face at the history of the country they live in would say such an absurd and insulting and offensive thing. This is not who we are. This is who we are. And until we confront it and deal with it, it's going to continue to be who we are. And, and, and this is just absolutely nuts. For people to think that somehow we're living in a land that treats everybody the same and, you know, that happened 150 years ago and, you know, and, oh, we're making progress because there's a black woman who's vice president. That's one black woman. What about the other 29 million black people in the country, 30 million black people in the United States? What about them? <laughs> oh, there's more inclusiveness at the Oscars and, and the BAFTAs and, and yeah, tonight at the BAFTAs or, you know, by the time you listen to this, it will have passed uh, by the event would have happened. The BAFTAs and this one won and that one won and ooh, isn't it progress? Progress for whom? For your consciousness? For your conscience? For your guilty conscience? Is that where the progress is being made? Or is it for the individual black person that wins at a ooh? What about the 30 million people? 30 million black people in the country. How about them? For pro have you have you polled them? And talk to them about how their lives are. Then I've got to hear. And I'll play it for you. Um, black people like Leo Terrell. Who's a conservative. And a jackass. Talking about. Oh there's no racism in the country. I mean. Um, I wonder now if he was the one. Who authored the UK report that was issued a couple of weeks ago now, a week or so ago, that said that there's no institutionalized racism in the United Kingdom. Come on, the United Kingdom's the hallmark of racism, motherfucker. I don't got to sit there with a report telling us, oh, it's not, oh, this is not, there's no institutionalized racism in the United Kingdom. The fucking hallmark of racism is in the UK. It's where I'm from. It's the hallmark of it. <laughs> I wonder, did Leo Terrell author that report? When you hear this video, video, when you hear this audio in a few short minutes, you'll know what I'm talking about here. <laughs> Let me be clear. I have spent 30 years of my life as a civil rights attorney. There is no systemic discrimination. There is no institutionalized racism in America. Jim Crow ended with the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Civil Rights Act of 1965. Joe Biden is lying from the Oval Office. That's why he is constantly lying about this and is hurting people. Race is an issue that divides this country. And Harris, I've been saying this all for the last couple of weeks. Why is he doing this? And I think is to not only divide this country, but to distract this country from the disaster at the border and also how he and the other Democrats are trying to bankrupt this country by spending more tax dollars because there is no racism, systemic, institutionalized, Jim Crow at all. I want you to know, dear listener, that that was a black man talking. That was so-called civil rights attorney Leo Terrell on Fox News last week. But let me get back to this. This is a federal civil lawsuit that the United States Army Lieutenant Caron Nazario filed last week. And this is from a story from David Lee, last name L-I, um, David Lee. Uh, and it's going to be from the NBC News. Police accused of threatening... Uh, pulling gun on Black Army Lieutenant during Virginia traffic stop. That's going to be part of the newsletter. Please subscribe at politocrat.substack.com. Politocrat.substack.com. And yeah, this is the, you know, it's just crazy. He drove, this is what happened. I'm just going to read this one portion of this. And again, this, this what you heard earlier on happened on December 5th of last year. 
December 5th, 2020. Nazario, who is black and Latino, conceded in his complaint, and I discussed this earlier with you, dear listener, conceded in his complaint that he didn't immediately pull over. He instead, listen to this. Here's the kicker right here. He instead put on his emergency lights and continued for another 100 seconds. Driving under the speed limit. So he could safely park in a well-lit gas station parking lot less than a mile down the road. See what we have to do as black people in this country called the U.S. of A.? Look at what we have to do. We have to actually disobey a police officer's order so that we hopefully won't get killed. So he was actually being followed by the police, right? And he didn't immediately pull over when they told him to. Now, that was not caught on the audio or the video that I played that you heard the audio from. That was not part of that portion of the tape of the video. But the point is this lieutenant Mr. Nazario put on his emergency lights continuing for another minute and 40 seconds driving under the speed limit so that he could safely park in a well-lit gas station. You know why he did that? Because he wanted it recorded. So that, God forbid, some, one of these two cops murders him in cold blood. The same way that Chauvin did. The same way that all these other cops have done and walked away. That it, There would be recording of it. So that there would be a case brought against these cops. And maybe, maybe, just maybe, Lieutenant... Caron Nazario could see the light of day again. That's why he did that. That's why. Some of you might go, well, he should have stopped immediately. He should have obeyed orders. And I said to you earlier, when he was in the gas station and he was told to get out of the car, I agree, he should have got out of the car. But I also told you why he did not immediately do so. Now that has to be worth a damn to you. If you're going to listen to me right now and say that, well, I don't care about what's happened to all these other black people. He needs to get out. And when the cops tell you to get out, you got to get out. That could be your view. But when you're black and you're told to get out of a vehicle and you've already got cops screaming at you and you did nothing. And your hands are showing. Come on now. Come on now. It's all okay to armchair quarterback this thing from the comfort and safety of your armchair in your living room or wherever on earth you are and say these kinds of stupid things. But you're ignoring and willfully so, I would think, at that point. The reality of this violent racist country and the reality of when a black person is confronted by cops, what could happen? Sean Bell, hours before he was going to get married, was shot something like 42 times by black police officers, by the way. This is about a violent outfit. I can tell you that the people who destroyed, or I should say the people who were part of the terrorist attack on the Capitol building, because nobody even calls it that anymore. It's now a riot now. Oh, really? Oh, it's changed. <laughs> Unbelievable. The terrorist attack on January 6th. Did you forget that already? We are already three months past, three months and five days. I didn't forget, as you can tell. By the thing. But 
Think about this, dear listener. None of those p- people who killed Brian Sicknick, the the Capitol Police officer, or any of those, they didn't get treated like United States Army Lieutenant Caron Nazaria. He got treated much worse. He got treated much worse. And he had to drive to a gas station so that there would be cameras. And he had to turn on his camera. Look at all the things that we as black people have to do. Just to stay alive. Just to exist. And he got people walking around here thinking that everything's okay. You couldn't have two more conflicting and contrasting worlds. You couldn't have two more different planets in the same neighborhood. In the same building, in the same street or on the same block. It's incredible and very dangerous, I might add. So you walk down the street, you wear a T-shirt that says Medgar, Malcolm, Martin on it. And you get these weird looks. Some people look scared. Why? Why? As James Baldwin said, why would you be threatened by American heroes? Why would you be threatened by them? You supposedly sell out, and this is me now talking, you supposedly celebrate American heroes, including the so-called American heroes who owned black people as property in this country. You celebrate them on President's Day, on July 4th, and all these other, Columbus Day, you know, Columbus Day. He, you know, who who butchered Native America. Are you kidding me? But, ooh, I walk down the street in San Francisco with a T-shirt on that says, Medgar, Malcolm, Martin. And all of a sudden, there are people with these looks on their faces. White people, usually. It's white people, most. Oh, my God. They look at it with curiosity and also perhaps a little bit of fear. I can see it in their eyes. Not true of everybody, but some people. They look scared, uncomfortable. Why? Why would you be uncomfortable? And all three of these people are no longer on the planet, number one. Number two, they were all about trying to make this country and this world a better place to live in. And to fight for the rights and freedoms and justice for black folk. Why why are you threatened by that? And that's what James Bond. Why are you why would those people be a source of fear for you instead of a source of great? We want a better society. Yeah. I support the and there are white people who who are fans of Malcolm X and, and uh Medgar Evers and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Of course there are. Uh, But again, there's a a, a significant wide swath of white Americans who, oh my God, you. It's like that tweeter I talked about who, who I've since blocked and who is unfollowed, thank God. And I've blocked him anyway. I've blocked them anyway. And... When, when that tweeter was saying, oh, you're rabble rousing, you're, st- you're spouting off, you're, oh, you're stirring up people for the Allah the capital. Allah the capital. Allah the capital. Really? So you're comparing what I was talking about? The very same thing I'm talking about now. That tweeter is trivializing. And now saying, well, you are now, oh, you're a ra-. See how they think about us? And it's the same kind of thing I see. When I walk down the street, I'm wearing a t-shirt. And I should be getting people going right on. And instead, I'm getting these fearful looks from some white people. Fearful. The other half of them probably don't even know what the, who the heck these people are. It could be Martin Jones. It could be Medgar Johnson. And it could be Malcolm Gladwell, for all they know, on that t-shirt. <laughs> it's like, I shouldn't presume that but my god man some people i mean i know that the people they're older people you know they know who these three people were 
it's, <laughs> it's, oh my God, this is just, oh my goodness me. Why, why are they a source of fear for some white people? Why? Why are you looking at Medgar Evers, Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, and the order is Medgar, Malcolm, Martin, and the reason they're in that order is because that was the order in which they were assassinated, sadly. Or in any order is sad. I mean, I don't want to mis- be misconstrued. And they, just not one person said any, ooh, but if I went to a black neighborhood in San Francisco, oh, there's not very many of those left. In fact, there really isn't any of them, maybe one. And I have to travel a distance to get there. But I'm telling you, if I walked down the street, as I did recently wearing a Harriet Tubman shirt from the store, dear listener, you've got to go purchase these great items that I design. All of them designed by yours truly. Everything you see on that store. But at the dash politocrat dot my shopify dot com. But if I walk down the street as it recently um, and it's, you know, mixed, mostly black uh, area or mostly black residents. And I'm getting right on. I love that shirt. I, that, this is great. Like, why isn't that true in a lot of the white enclaves in San Francisco? I mean, you know, most of San Francisco is white. I mean, it's 93, 94% white in San Francisco. People are shocked when they hear that because they think, ooh, San Francisco is nice and liberal. And it's got, no, and liberal has got nothing to do with population. And that's why that word liberal is so misplaced. So I should stop using it as well because I don't like that word. You could be a liberal misogynist. You could be a liberal racist. You could be, you know, your ideology left, right or center has nothing to do with the kind of human being you are in terms of your thoughts and feelings about other people. Because there are lots of Democrats who beat their spouses. And there are lots of people who call themselves Republican who don't. There are lots of people who are Democratic, who are politicians, who inflict pain and torture and violence upon the women that those male politicians are with. And there are lots of Republicans who actually don't, and vice versa. Of course, there are lots of Republicans who are, who do. So this isn't about party. When you throw all that nonsense in, that's how you split people. That's how you uh, skirt the issue and don't deal with the violence against women and you pretend it doesn't exist and you start labeling it, oh, it's one party, but oh, it's that party's problem. Oh, it's that. And you're doing this and the issue is still there, meanwhile. Unaddressed. Unaccounted for. Not dealt with. Not fixed. And the thing I really want to get back to is A, why why, why are people so afraid of that? And of the t-shirt. And shouldn't everybody be going, yeah, right on? Shouldn't we be doing I know, of course, that sounds like utopia, doesn't it? But shouldn't we? And then the other thing is, is again, I'm going to get back to, if, if we cared about the humanity of black people in this country, we would not only have these laws in place, we would have, as I said, with what happened to Asian people and what continues to happen right here in San Francisco on a daily basis. People being Asian, people being killed, being beaten, we would have a welcoming committee for Asian people or black people in this country if we really cared. We wouldn't have to wait until someone hits, kills, violates, attacks an Asian woman or an Asian person in general. We wouldn't have to wait and then start to tell people, don't hate, anti-hate, stop the hate. And I'm all for stopping the hate and ending it. I also, in addition to that, want proactive measures so that the whole society starts to speak a more welcoming language to everybody, but particularly black people and Asian people and brown people. Speak a more welcoming language. Do things proactively that actually encompass something so that people of all groups feel welcomed. Asians feel welcomed. It's not just you're here and we're nervously tolerating you in quotes. And I hate that word, toleration. I'm holding my nose. That's what tolerance is. It's you're holding your nose while someone you don't like or you hate or are afraid of is walking and coexisting in the same space as you. That's what tolerance is. 
That's the way I look at tolerance. But what we need is a welcoming language, a welcoming ethos, a society that embraces and welcomes people from the giddy. That's what we need. We've got to have that. Got to have that. Otherwise, it's all paper tigers, isn't it? It's all paper tigers. We've got to have a loving society. We've got to have that reflected, not only in our laws, but in our attitudes. The police can't be just drawing their guns on everybody who's black. You can't be just drawing your gun. You've got your guns drawn? This guy didn't fire a weapon at you. This guy didn't have a weapon. And that's why I'm going to stop saying unarmed black person. I'm going to say just, I'm going to say black person. You know why? Because it's as if, if the person is armed, the cops have the right to shoot them and kill them. And they actually don't. If a black person or any person has a firearm and they've not used it and they have it and they're not posing any threat, although, of course, if you're armed, you do. You think it's okay if they have a gun and they're not doing anything with it, but they have it? That you think it's okay for the cop to pull out a gun and just blast him away or blast her away? Because I dare say, I think a whole lot of people do. I don't know if you do, but I think a lot of people on this planet think, and especially here in the U.S., think it's perfectly okay if there's a black person down the street with a gun just walking with it that if a cop rolls up on that cop uh, on that brother uh, or sister and shoots them and kills them they think that's okay here's where i get you open carry open friggin carry then what Oh, oh, open carry. Oh, oh, well, uh, uh, um. Oh, oh, you didn't see that one coming, did you? Ooh, you didn't hear that one coming. Open carry. When you've got white boys and girls carrying their guns. And they're not doing anything with them either. I mean, they'd love to. I'm sure they'd love to kill themselves a few black folk and brown folk and Asians. Maybe, maybe not. But they walk around with their guns. They're not getting shot by police. They're not getting... And I'm not advocating for them by to be, by the way. But they're not getting shot. What do you think now? What does the... I wonder what a white person would think about that. Do... Does the same white person who would say, Yeah, kill them, kill them. And they don't use the word black either. For the black person who's walking with a gun but not doing anything with it. Is their answer the same when the open carry in Texas and other states, Michigan, allow people to carry their guns and those guns are AR-15s or whatever the hell they rifles, whatever the hell they are, and they're allowed to carry those openly? Would that white person who was cheerleading police to the no, uh, in the notion of they can go kill this black person if they just have a weapon on them? Would that answer be the same for that same white Yahoo who now is told, oh, what about open carry? And those people being white people walking down the street, do you would you cheerlead the cops blowing them away? We must have a society that is compassionate and you show that compassion not with at the end of it all after six Asian women are blown away in the Atlanta area last month you with oh stop the hate stop the hate now I'm not knocking that because I'm a proponent of that please go to stop aapi hate.org by the way I'm saying to you That should not be the only thing. I shouldn't have to walk San Francisco streets and see signs saying, don't hurt the Asians. Because, I mean, yeah, I I, I believe in that and I agree I'm all for not violently attacking Asian people. I support all of 
those things, those initiatives that say stop the hate, end the violence. I am all for that. But my whole point is we shouldn't have to do that at the back end. We should be proactively welcoming Asian people. They've been here forever, by the way. They've been here for many years. They built the rail. You had Chinese building the railroads in this country. And being horribly treated as well, by the way. And I've got to tell you, you have to start building a welcoming society. Welcoming. That's where this starts from. And you've got to do that. It can't stay the way it is. And it's not going to, at least in the long run. Because you're going to have a population that looks more brown, more black, more Asian. And that is a fact. The question is, do the systemic dynamics change? And I dare say they will not. It will just be with black and brown faces and Asian faces. But the same oppressive system is still going to be there unless we do something to change that reality. And we've got to have a compassionate society. We have to. It's not enough to just put people of different backgrounds and different face expressions, excuse me, complexions, into governments. It's about changing the ethos, changing the mentality, being proactive. That's why I like Tashara Jones, the mayor of soon to be the mayor of St. Louis, the first black female mayor of St. Louis, Missouri, because she's speaking the language of someone who wants to welcome, who is welcoming, and who will call things out, and who will do things, and will get in the trenches and be an advocate and work for the people, instead of working for a paycheck like a lot of these senators do on Capitol Hill. And some of these Republicans in the House do. Well, all of them do. I don't care about the people. Since when did these Republicans care about the people? Uh, it just It's just non-existent. At least these last 60 plus years. It's just non-existent. There's always an exception or two. But it's really non-existent. We've got to change the way we behave. And the culture has to change. The whole culture of the country. And state by state, brick by brick. That's how this has to happen. And the newer generation can help effectuate that. I don't think social media is the place. Although it's an important tool. It's also a very destructive one. But we need to have our own platforms to promote this. We really do. If we pool money and resources together. There's no reason why we can't do that. And I'm not saying that we're going to compete directly with Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. But we need those safe spaces. We need to promote that. But that's one small piece of this. The people who are in power in all of these governments, state, local and federal, have to start adopting. And we have to push them to do this. A welcoming model. All of the things that have happened over the last 14 to 15 months around the planet should tell you something. That we have to radically change how we see each other, how we deal with each other. We've got to start telling the truth and teaching history and confronting it. I don't care how uncomfortable the person is. You've got to. Got to. Because how do you heal? How do you even start to? How do you start to move forward if you don't acknowledge that trauma that hit you when you were three years old, six years old, nine, 12. Come on. In your basic life, you've had traumas that you try not to deal with, right? But you can point to them and you hopefully, if this has happened to you in your life, have tried to talk about it at least. Or if you can't afford a counselor or therapist, you've at least talked about it. We don't do that when it comes to our history. We mention it here and there, but we don't deal with it. We must become a better people. And we've got to start welcoming each other. 
at the very minimum, hasn't 14 or 15 months of a pandemic shown you anything? Hasn't it taught you something? I mean, I'm sorry again. I, I know you're sick of me saying this, dear listener. But the, all of this celebrating, oh, I got my vaccine, ooh, woohoo, happy days, when, when we should be doing something else. Uh, again, if people want to do that, that's entirely up to you. And as I say, there's not been much to celebrate these last 14 to 15 months. So knock yourself out, have a good time and celebrate. But I'm sorry, there's a whole world out here that is never getting vaccinated, right? So... You know, celebrating that, right? Celebrating that you got your vaccine. I mean, I'm sorry. There's a whole 90% of the planet that doesn't have access to vaccinations. And then you got jerks in this country. Oh, I'm not going to get it. I'm not going to get vaccinated. Absolutely disgusting. And this, this is who we are. Thank you very much for listening to this edition of The Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore. (laughs) 